Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Uncommon Solutions for Common Obstacles and Objections by Dave Fellman. Before we get started, I'll go over a few things so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions to Dave by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send your questions in at any time and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end. If we don't have time to answer all the questions, we'll record them and Dave will answer them in writing after the webinar and we'll send you a copy of the answers. To give you a brief introduction on today's presenter, Dave is the author of the small business book, 10 Ways to Make Your Small Business More Successful and Listen to the Dinosaur, which Selling Power magazine listed as one of its 10 best books to read in 2010. His articles on sales, marketing and management topics have appeared in a variety of publications and he's a popular speaker who has delivered seminars and keynotes at events across the United States, Canada, Ireland, Australia and New Zealand. I'll now hand over to Dave. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you very much, Kate, and I want to uh, add my welcome to everybody to tell you how uh, pleased and excited I am to be sitting in a hotel room in San Antonio, Texas in the United States at 8 o'clock at night on uh, October the 5th, presenting a webinar to uh, a group in Australia at noon the next day. We live in a world with amazing capabilities. But we also live in a world that uh, isn't as easy as uh, we as salespeople might like it to be. We uh, every day call on customers, prospects, potential customers, people that uh, we would like to sell to, that we, that we hope to earn money from, um, and they don't make it easy. They throw obstacles at us. They, uh, they throw objections at us. They make it difficult sometimes to succeed in sales. But you know what? I've decided, or maybe I should say it differently, I've observed in my career in 37 years now as a sales rep and sales manager and consultant in the promotional products and printing and signage industries, I've observed that there's just not that many things that, uh, that they say when they're not saying yes. I mean, we face a, a group of very common obstacles and objections, so my position is we can and we should prepare our responses. We shouldn't be surprised when somebody uh, throws one of these really pretty common obstacles and objections at us. We should be ready for it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to give you some ideas on how you might deal with a few of these uh, selling problems. Before we get to that, though, I think we might want to spend a couple of minutes on internal obstacles. Because I work with a lot of people um, especially owners of small companies, small businesses, who, who really have as much trouble with the internal stuff as they do with the external. And by that I'm talking about questions like, I don't know where to start, you know, when it's time to go out to look for new business and it's so hard to find the time and, and I keep getting interrupted. So let's start with not knowing where to start. Um, you're in sales, and you hopefully are not raw rookies at sales. You hopefully have been doing this for a while, which means that you already have some customers. Well, if you want some more customers, I think you should start by looking at the people and the companies who are already buying from you and asking yourself a couple of questions. One of them is, well, what is it about this business that requires the need for a lot of promotional products? And then take it a step further, what is it about this individual, this, this person who gives me the orders that uh, creates a good match with me? And then, once you've identified uh, the kind of company that, that you already connect with and the kind of people that you already connect with, go look for more companies and more people like those. I hear a lot of salespeople overcomplicating the issue. You know, they say, well, where should I go? Who should I call on? What should I be doing? Let's not overcomplicate. And in fact, 
let's make it even simpler. If you don't know where to start, just go out and start talking to people, no matter what kind of business they may be in. Just go out and talk to them and ask them, do you have any need or any interest in the kind of stuff that I sell? And they may need some help in understanding the kind of stuff that you sell, so simply tell them. I sell promotional products. I say things like sell things like this or that or the other thing. I sell drinkware. I sell writing instruments. I sell embroidered uh, polo shirts. Help them to understand what you sell. Ask them if they've got any interest and if there seems to be a match, move forward. And if there isn't, move sideward. Go talk to somebody else to see if there might be a better match. As far as finding the time and dealing with interruptions, let's talk a little bit about making the time to get to the next level, whatever that next level may be for you. More customers, more sales volume, more income. Here's a couple of new rules that I, that I want you to consider. The first of which is that there is time if you make time. And as noted, I, I work with a lot of people who tell me, I'd like to increase my sales, I'd like to make more money, it's just so hard to find the time to go out and do the prospecting. Here's what I tell them. Take the word find out of that sentence and replace it with the word make and the understanding that you simply got to make the time to do the things that are important to you. You have to work at it. And consider, too, that some things are more important than others. To my mind, the most important thing for a promotional product salesperson is to do the things that keep your current customers happy, but that's followed very closely by doing the things that will help you to gain new customers or sell more stuff to your current customers. Because, and I don't want this to sound like I'm um, uh, you know, coming out here with some sort of dirty word, but many salespeople say that they're not in it for the money. I think you should be. I mean, I think most of us go to work to earn a living. And one of the great things about being a salesperson, especially a product line like ours, is that you have the opportunity to make more money. It comes with selling more stuff. To me, it's kind of sad when salespeople don't take advantage of the earnings opportunity. I guess what I'm saying is the money's there. Let's go make the money. Now, another new rule for making the time to get to the next level is connect every task on your list to a person. First of all, I should say this. I hope that you start every day with some sort of a task list, with a, with a things to do list, with a listing of all of the things that you have on your plate for that day. And I know people who use sophisticated software to uh, generate that list for them, and I know people who keep their lists on paper. Um, it doesn't matter to me whether you use new technology or old technology or primitive technology. What matters to me is that you, you start every day with a list of the things that are on your plate. But let's take it another step and connect every one of those tasks to a person. Think about this now. Isn't it true that every task that's on your plate, everything that, that you said you wanted to do that day or you've been asked to do that day, you're either doing it for some other person or with some other person or to some other person? It's important that you understand who each task is connected to, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Before I do that, I want to encourage you to also connect every task to a hat. Now, I suspect that some of you are business owners, the owners of uh, promotional products distributorships, which means that you wear at least several hats on any given day. You have your sales hat, you have your purchasing hat, you have your customer service hat, you have your project management hat, you may have an administrative hat, a finance hat, a family hat. Um, it, it takes a lot of hats, and even full-time salespeople. You might think of yourself as having a prospecting hat, a project management hat, a customer maintenance hat. So is part of the process, as part of the process where you're looking at your task list and, and connecting every one of those tasks to the person you're doing it to or with or for, 
I want you to connect each task to the hat that's involved. And the reason I want you to do that is because that will then allow you to build your day, to plan your day around blocks and hats. Here's what I'm suggesting. Actually, let me relate this to uh, my day yesterday. I had two writing tasks on my list yesterday. And I thought that one of those tasks would take me about an hour and one of them would take me about 20 minutes. So I built an hour block of time. As it happened, it was from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. yesterday morning to do the first writing task. And then I blocked out uh, half an hour, a little more than I thought I'd actually need, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to address the other half, the other writing task. I also had about 25 follow-up calls, potential new business development calls. And I know from my own experience that I can typically make six to eight of those calls in an hour. I mean, some of them are just, I make a phone call, I, I leave a voicemail message, I update my CRM and I move on to the next task. Sometimes it only takes a couple of minutes. Sometimes I actually connect with the person and talk for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or even longer, but on average, six to eight. So I'm looking at 25 or so tasks and I'm knowing that that's gonna take three to four hours. So I schedule a block of time from 10 o'clock to 11.30, an hour and a half, and another block of time from three o'clock to 4.30 and because I had a lot of other stuff on my plate that day, I told myself, you gotta move quickly through the, uh, these tasks. You gotta get your average closer to eight than to six. Anyways, the point of it is that I built blocks of time when I was going to be doing similar tasks. And the reason for that is because I wanted to create some efficiency. I wanna get myself, and I hope that this is a term that will, will resonate with you. I hope it's a term that you use in Australia. I wanted to get in the zone. I wanted to get into the zone where, you know, I, I'd done a similar task a couple of times. I was into the flow, I was into the zone. In other words, I was, I was creating efficiency for myself that way. And here's an important part of this uh, strategy. During that block of time between 10 and 11.30, when I was planning to make sales calls, I did not let myself get interrupted by anything else. And my phone rang a few times, and I have caller ID on the phone. I could see who the callers were. And if one of them had been you know, a life or death situation, I would have taken the call. But because none of them were critical, you know, urgent, something that had to be done right now, I just let all those calls go to voicemail. And then between 11.30 and 12, after the completing the block of time when I was making sales calls, I had scheduled a block of time to catch up with whatever else came in up to that point in the morning. And that's an important understanding. I actually built in a block of time to deal with the stuff that came up but I didn't let the stuff that came up interrupt me. Here's something that I think I've observed among salespeople all over the world. They make it easy to interrupt them themselves. They make it way too easy to get off track. I'm saying, let's make it hard to get off track. I'm saying, let's build a plan for every day, built around priorities, built around hats, and, and let's follow the plan rather than letting ourselves get distracted and getting off track. And then that takes us back to the idea that uh, you connect every task to a person because I think it's really important that you prioritize people, not tasks or hats. Think about this for a moment. If you're anything like me, you have more opportunity in front of you than you have hours in the day to uh, take advantage of those opportunities, to capture those opportunities. And I schedule my days very aggressively. I mean, I'm trying to uh, get a lot done every day. I build a plan every morning for a very full day of activity that does not include any of the interruptions that are gonna come up. So functionally for me, 
if I'm going to let myself get interrupted, if I'm going to add anything to my plan, something has to come out of the plan. Something that I had put into the day has to come out of the day because there's simply not enough time otherwise. Now think about what that means. If you have a customer who wants you to do something for them during the day and you don't do it, they might be mad at you. If you have, let's say, 25 tasks on your plate at the beginning of the day and you only have time to do 20 of them, well, I think you understand that you have to prioritize aggressively just with those numbers. And if you have uh, 50 tasks in front of you and only time to do 20 of them, you, you have to prioritize, I call it, violent prioritization. But here's the thing. Anytime you get to the end of the day and there's something that you haven't done for somebody, they might be mad at you, there might be repercussions, but the important understanding and the good news is you get to pick who's going to be mad at you. Think about that. You get to pick who's going to be mad at you by the way you prioritize and the way you react to interruptions and the way you manage your time. If you choose to take risks with the people who are least important to you, well, you still might suffer some consequences for that, but you'll still be as far ahead of the game as it is possible to be. Think about it this way. If you don't have enough time or other resources to make everybody happy, make good decisions about who you do make happy and who you take risks with. Now. Let's talk about the external obstacles and let's start with uh, gatekeepers, secretaries, receptionists, the people who are in between you and the people that, uh, that you're trying to, that you're hoping to sell to. There's a perception among many of the salespeople I work with that, that gatekeepers think their job is to keep salespeople from ever getting to talk to the people who make the buying decisions. Yeah, I guess there are gatekeepers like that. But uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that they do it as purposefully as many salespeople seem to think. And I really want to raise the question, what is it that you need gatekeepers for in the first place? And to my mind, all you really need the gatekeepers for is to help you to identify the person that you ultimately have to sell to. I mean, I think gatekeepers are a source of, of information, a, a place to do some research. And I think that in the modern world, it's not that hard, it's not that difficult to be, get beyond the secretary or receptionist. In the old days, you know, when, when the telephone was the, uh, the main link between, uh, between sellers and buyers, it was a different story. If you couldn't get the, uh, the receptionist to, to transfer your call to the person who bought the promotional products, you were in trouble. But we have so many other ways to get to them. We have telephone, we have landlines, we have cell phones, we have email, we have text, we have uh, Facebook, we have LinkedIn. I don't think gatekeepers are as big a problem as they used to be, but I also don't think that, uh, that many salespeople take full advantage of the opportunity that gatekeepers provide. So let's go back to the idea of uh, I don't know where to start. Well, I think you start with companies like the companies that you already are selling to. And then who do you have to sell to? Who's the person who makes the buying decisions? Give some thought to this. What is the title of the person who's actually giving you orders? If you know the title, maybe once you identify a company, you can go to the company's website. Maybe there's a staff directory. Maybe you can just uh, look down that staff directory and get the name of the person who, uh, who buys what you sell. Not every company has a staff directory, though, at the website. Sometimes you need to ask somebody. That's what I think gatekeepers are for. I will tell you this though, certainly in the United States, if you call up and you say, hi there, I sell promotional products, I would like to talk to the person who buys the promotional products of your company, that has proven not to be a very good strategy for success. But how about this? Hi, my name is David Fellman from, uh, from David Fellman Promotional Products. I would like to send some information about my company 
to your company. And I'm hoping that you can tell me, who do I send it to? Who's the person who's most involved in buying anything from pens with the logo on it to uh, uh, cups or mugs with the logo on it to uh, t-shirts or sweaters or uh, any sort of apparel with your company logo on it? Who would that be? In my experience, the gatekeepers are, uh, are quite likely to give you the name of the person that you're ultimately looking for. And then we got lots of ways to, uh, to get through to them. Starting with calling them on the telephone. But let's face the fact that uh, if you call them on the telephone in this day and age, the chances are pretty good that uh, you're going to get connected to voicemail. All right. If, if we had the opportunity to actually converse on this call, if, if, we had, uh, if you weren't muted, muted, I would say, do you love voicemail or hate voicemail? And, and I bet most of you would say, I hate voicemail. Because there's this perception, again, there's this perception among salespeople that uh, buyers hide behind their voicemail. And I don't think that's true at all. I don't think they hide behind their voicemail. I think they use their voicemail as a tool to make them more productive. And sometimes when I'm in a playful mood, I, I ask salespeople, did you know that voicemail was actually invented by a salesperson? And I'm pretty sure that wasn't true. But uh, let me tell you why I think voicemail is good for salespeople. It gives you the opportunity to talk to the people you want to talk to. And I want you to understand that, that I'm an old guy. When I started in sales, there was no such thing as voicemail. Um, this was when receptionists, gatekeepers were a problem. Sometimes they wouldn't want to take the message, you know, and, and they certainly didn't want to take a long message from a salesperson. All they wanted, um, in the best case scenario, might be Dave Feldman and his phone number. Voicemail lets you talk directly to the people you want to talk to. And I bet that. Uh, you hear the same outgoing messages that I do when people say, uh, leave a detailed message, leave a detailed message. They're not saying, talk as fast as you can and just leave me your phone number and I'll get back to you if I think I want to. They're saying, leave a detailed message and I'll listen to it and I'll decide whether I want to call you back. So here's what I recommend. Leave a detailed message. Maybe that's going too far. But, but what I'm saying is don't be afraid to leave a longish message. Don't feel like you've only got, uh, you know, five seconds to leave your name and your company name and your phone number and, you know, anything longer than that and they're going to delete your message. But think in these terms, whatever you say needs to be compelling. And think about this. When you're leaving a voicemail message for somebody, you are not trying to sell promotional products. You are trying to sell something. What you're trying to sell is the idea that they should call you back. So the voicemail message is not about setting an appointment. It's not about getting an order. It's about, let me tell you why I think you should call me back. Consider the sort of voicemail message that, uh, that I might leave. And I think of it as sort of a three-part message. And it starts with, hi, my name is David Feldman from Dave Feldman Promotional Products. I would like to uh, sit down and talk with you about your promotional products needs. Please give me a call. The number is 919-363-4068. But I don't stop there. I pause, and then I continue, and I might say something like this. I might say, you know, I bet you get a lot of phone calls from salespeople. And I bet that returning those phone calls is probably not at the top of your priority list every day. But this is a call that I think you should return. And let me tell you why. And I actually say that. I say, this is a call I think you should return. Let me tell you why. And then I might continue and I might say something like this. I think you should call me back because I've been working in this industry for some number of years. It's great if you could say 15 years, 20 years, even more than that, because then you could say, and I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that uh, 20 years of product knowledge might be of value to you. I'm not just calling you because I want to get some orders from you. I'm calling you because I think that uh, my knowledge might bring real value to your business. And if you agree, 
call me back. And again, the number is. If all you're doing is asking people to call you back, they might not. But if you give them a good reason to, they are far more likely to do what you want them to do. And I'm not saying that there's any kind of message that you could leave that'll get 10 out of every 10 people to call you back. But if your current success ratio is one out of 10, and embracing this sort of strategy, leaving a better message might get you up to two out of 10 or three out of 10, I would take that, because consider this, two out of 10 is twice as good as one out of 10. Now, I also want you to understand that when you're in the prospecting stage, and you're calling people to try to get them to, to talk with you, to take the next step with you. Sometimes you're hearing them say, I don't want to meet with you. Sometimes you're hearing them say, I don't want to buy from you. Um, but I want you to recognize that these are not the same statement. It's not the same obstacle. And the truth of the matter is, Nobody can really decide whether they want to buy from you or, or not until they've met with you. In the early stages of selling, in the prospecting stages, the one you're probably running into is, I don't want to meet with you. And maybe I'll phrase that a little bit differently, because a lot of people already have a supplier for what you sell. And they're happy with their current supplier. So what they're thinking is they, they don't really need to meet with you. So now let's think, what could you say that would give them a reason to invest a little time in talking with you, even if, even if they've already got a supplier? Well, let me jump ahead a little bit in the graphics. I want to ask you, what do you say when they say, I'm happy with my current supplier? And, and a lot of times, this is, this is what you hear. They don't say, I don't want to meet with you. What they say is, I'm happy with my current supplier. So let me tell you what I've heard many salespeople say. They say, well, that's good. I appreciate that, uh, that you're loyal to your current supplier. Personally, I think that's a bunch of crap. I'm never happy to find out that somebody's happy with their current supplier. I don't want them to be loyal. I want them to start buying from me. And then I hear a lot of other salespeople say things like, well, okay, but, you know, please consider me as a backup if there's anything that, you know, they can't do for you. And I don't like that strategy for a couple of reasons, one of which is that all it might accomplish is to put you on the bottom rung of what might be a really tall ladder. I mean, think about this. Would you agree when I say that most people who buy a lot of promotional products right now they already have a primary supplier and they already have a backup supplier. So maybe base case scenario is that you're asking to be a backup to the backup or maybe a backup to the backup to the backup. I don't like the strategy for that reason and I also don't like this strategy because it's wimpy, because it's weak. Please consider me as a backup, really, seriously? When they throw an obstacle at you, let's take it head on. Let's take it on. They're happy with their current supplier. Well, I want to talk about just how happy you are. And let me tell you how I address that. I would say, who is your current supplier? Who are you working with now? And for the sake of discussion, let's say that the answer was uh, Great Barrier Reef Promotional Products, which I just pulled out of my brain. Great Barrier Reef Promotional Products. I would say, oh yeah, they're very good. In fact, they're probably the second best promotional products company in Australia. Now, I'm hoping that some of you giggled when you heard me say that, and that's exactly the response I'm hoping for from, from the, the person that I'm talking to, because if you get a little giggle, if you get a little laugh, it shows that they get the joke, you know, that, that, that they understand what you're saying. But then you can continue and you could say, seriously, that's a very good company, but uh, so are we. You know, he's a very knowledgeable supplier, but, but so am I. And my position is that uh, it would be worth 20, 30 minutes of your time to meet with me to see if I might even be better than he is, than she is, than they are. Now, I also have a philosophy that all promotional products buyers will fit into one of five categories. 
and I call them solids, liquids, gases, players, and price monsters. Solids are happy with their current supplier, period, end of story, they're not going to change. Are there solids in the marketplace? Of course there are, and hopefully you know that because you have solids among your own current customers. Liquids are almost exactly like solids with one important difference. Liquids will talk to you. If you can give them a good reason to talk to you, and, and maybe a combination of humor and logic is what I'm saying. Yeah, they're the second best supplier in Australia, and uh, let's, let's talk and see if I might be even better than them. A little humor, a little logic is sometimes enough to get a liquid to agree to talk with you, to meet with you, to take you seriously. Now think about this for a moment too. If, if you take a customer away from a competitor because you convince that customer that you're better than their current supplier, I think that what that means is they become your solid and that's the kind of customers that we're looking for. As opposed to price monsters who make all of their decisions based strictly and only on who offers them the lowest price or the players, the ones who spread their work around, and uh, they're price sensitive to the degree that they probably give each order to whoever among their group of trusted suppliers gives them the lowest price. I don't want it to be about price. I do not want it to be about price, and I don't think you do either. I think you want to win customers because you convince them that you provide better quality, better service, greater value. So that's what I say when they say I'm happy with my supplier. Let me tell you what I say when they say I'm really busy right now. I say, when would be a better time? That's all I say, when would be a better time? And if somebody says to me, call me next week, call me in a couple of weeks, call me after the first of the month, something like that, I just say, you got it. That's all I say. I don't say, can we set a time now for me to call you in two weeks or, you know, what would be a good day to call you in two weeks? I think of that as pushing hard against a soft obstacle because in my experience, if somebody says, call me next week, they're interested. Now, when somebody says, call me in six months, that's a whole different story, but let me get back to that in just a moment. Let's come back to call me in, in a couple of weeks. I make a note. To remind myself, I make the call, and when I make the call, here's what I say. I say, hi, this is Dave Feldman from Dave's Promotional Products. I hope you'll remember we talked briefly a couple of weeks ago. You asked me to uh, call you in a couple of weeks. We were talking about setting up an appointment. How does your schedule look for later on this week or early next week or some appropriate time? Here's something else I want to try and get across to you today. I think prospecting is all about trying to get people to meet with you. Now sometimes that meeting has to be over the telephone. Mostly though I think we want to meet face to face. I mean that's I think we'd all agree that that's the the best scenario, the best case scenario is to get face to face with people who buy what we sell. So, when I'm making prospecting calls, my goal is to get them to meet with me and everything else happens after that. Now what about the guy who says, call me in six months? In my experience, when they say that, they might be hoping that you'll forget about them, you know, or leave the industry or something between now and then. So here's what I might say if somebody says, call me in six months. I might say, I can do that. But while I got you, let me ask you one more question. Because I think I've learned in my career that when somebody says, call me in six months, there's really two possibilities, one of which is you, you do want to talk to me and six months is the right time to do it. And the other possibility is that you don't want to talk to me but you don't want to hurt my feelings. Please, sir, ma'am, um, I'm a big boy. I can take it if it's bad news. Don't, don't worry about hurting my feelings. And I've had people say, you know, well, that's, that's what it is, you know. And, and, and then I might say, all right, well, thanks you know, have a good life. Or else, if I'm feeling feisty on any given day, I might say, I don't get it. Why, why would you not want to meet with somebody who's been working in this industry for 20 years and just wants to bring all that experience to, to work for you and your company? Here's the thing. You can't sell to everybody. I wish you could. I wish I could, but none of us can. And I think that, and this is 
takes us back to time management from a time management perspective. If, if you're not ever going to succeed with somebody, if they don't want to talk with you, you're better off knowing that sooner rather than later. Because here's another thing that goes kind of hand in hand with the, you can't sell to everybody. I don't think any of you, any of us, are ever going to run out of people to maybe sell to. And as long as both of those statements are true, that means that when you run into somebody who doesn't want to talk to you, you don't have to keep pushing forward, you know, trying to get them to talk to you. You can go sideward and give somebody else the opportunity to talk to you. Now, what do you say when somebody says, I don't need anything right now? Another common obstacle. I would say, when would be a better time? You know, when, when do you expect to, uh, to need to order some promotional products? That's pretty straightforward. But think about this. Maybe there is a better strategy. How about if you said, I understand, and that doesn't bother me. In fact, I kind of would like the opportunity to talk to you before you need to uh, place an order for some sort of promotional product. Because what I would like to do is to sit down and talk to you about, uh, about what you buy, about uh, you know, how you use it in your business. Um, about how well it's working for you. And if we could do that sometime sooner rather than later, then maybe when you do need something, I can be you know, more than just another promotional product supplier who could give you a quote on pens or something like that. I think it's safe for me to say that, that you want to be consultative salespeople that you do want to talk about not just what they buy, but, but what they're using it for and how it works. And I think you want to put yourself in a position to bring value by maybe suggesting better items or, or, or just flat out better ideas. I know this though, a lot of salespeople think that the best prospect is somebody who's got something that you can quote on right away. Me personally, I think the best prospect is the one who will buy a lot of what I sell over the course of you know, a six months or a year, but who will also give me the opportunity to build a relationship with them before we have to start talking about pricing. Think about this. In the absence of a relationship, price is going to be important. And price is also going to be the easiest thing for, for them to measure. I mean, it's really pretty easy to look at two quotes and say, ooh, this one is smaller than the other one, and I want to pay as little as I can for, you know, any item that I might be buying. So, therefore, you know, I'm going to buy it from the people who've got the lowest price. I think you're in much better shape if you've established a consultative relationship with them beforehand, because even then, even if your price is a little higher, you know, not, not out of the competitive range, but, but a little higher than the lowest possible price. Maybe they're thinking, well, you know, I could buy it for less, but, but I want to buy it from, from this person, from this company. Now, what do you say if somebody says, we're under contract? I think this is another straightforward situation. I would just ask them, when, does the, uh, when do the negotiations, the, uh, the renewal negotiations start? Because there's no such thing, or at least I've never found a permanent contract. At some point, there's going to be you know, a, another discussion. I just want to position myself to, uh, to be in the competition when it starts. But, but actually, I want to do more than that. And this is a very similar situation to I don't need anything right now. Even if it's an annual contract that doesn't expire until the end of 2017, I still want to meet with them sooner rather than later and talk with them sooner rather than later. And I want to explore not just the length of the contract, but also the width and the height. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The width of the contract refers to exactly what does it cover and it has been my experience that uh, there's not that many comprehensive contracts that cover everything that might fit into the promotional products product line. 
I mean, I've run into people who told me we're under contract, and I've, I've learned that, yeah, they're under contract for their uniform stuff, but they're not under contract for, uh, for, for sports uh, stuff. So sometimes if you can get the opportunity to talk to them, you'll find out that there are items that you can, you can start competing for right now. And then I also want to explore the height of the contract. And what I mean by that is their level of satisfaction with what they're getting from the current supplier. Here's something I know. I know that a lot of people are getting really good pricing and really lousy quality in service. And they're not especially happy with that. And if that's the case, I want to know that because that ultimately becomes my leverage maybe to uh, win their business at a higher price when the next contract discussion comes around. Now, I'm coming back to that topic in just a moment. That's sort of where we're going to close our program today. Quickly let me run through what I say when they say send me some literature. Again, keeping in mind that I think prospecting is all about getting to the meeting stage. I don't want to just send them literature. I want to sit and meet with them face to face. So if somebody says, send me some literature, I would say, well, I could do that. But let me ask you this. I mean, wouldn't that just be me sending you information about us, me telling you about us? And, and don't you think that uh, it would be more important for us to get out there and learn about you? It's been my experience that uh, people don't want salespeople to come and you know, call on them, make a presentation, and say, yeah, this is what I sell. You need some. People respond much better to the consultative salespeople who, who go out and, and they want to learn about the company so that they can provide expertise. And I have found that the best way to get uh, people to do what you want them to do is to position it as a benefit to them. So yeah, I could send you some literature, but, but don't you think it might be more valuable to have me come out there and start learning about your company and your needs and, and what we need to do for you. All right, now, what do you say when they say your price is too high? If you embrace the kind of consultative sales strategy that, uh, that I teach, when you go out on that uh, first appointment, when you have the opportunity to meet and have that first substantive conversation, it's not going to be a presentation. It is going to be a conversation. And you're going to ask them not just about what they buy, but about how it's working and about their level of satisfaction with the current supplier. My favorite question is, is there anything you would change if you could. I mean, anything, no matter how small, anything about the quality or about the service or about the way you buy from them or about the way they sell to you or, or about the way the, uh, the products work for you as, as part of your overall marketing or, or your uniform plan or your safety plan or whatever it may be. I want to ask that question because I often find myself in a situation where at some point later on, I quote them a price, and it's more than they've been paying. Well, I just want to be able to say, yeah, it is more than you've been paying, but didn't you tell me that you weren't happy with the quality, or you weren't happy with the service, or you weren't happy with something? The only justification for a higher price is a greater value. And very often, the definition of a greater value is better quality, better service, better advice. You can charge more if you give more. That's been proven in the marketplace. But you need to prepare yourself to defend your price. And I've learned in my own career that, that if you embrace a strategy like this, first, identifying whatever weakness they may be in the uh, in, in the relationship with the current supplier. And if you put yourself in a position to tell them why you think they should uh, pay your price, even though, yeah, it is a little bit higher. In my experience, there's only three possible ways that uh, people can respond. And one of them, and it's happened to me many times in my career, 
is when I've told people why I thought they should buy from me anyway. When I've explained that, you know, I asked you about problems you've had and you told me about um, problems and pain and the solution to those problems and the relief for that pain is in my price. That That's all contained in the price that, uh, that I'm going to charge you. And yes, it's more than you were paying, but, but, but it's what you were asking for. I found that sometimes they listen and they agree. You know, it makes sense to them. They say, yeah, well, you're right. I actually had a guy not too long ago, I had this happen for, I bet, the 20th time in my career, but it's no less wonderful. When the guy said, you know, I'm kind of understanding what happened now. I bought cheap and I got what I paid for. I was very happy to hear that guy talk himself into buying from me. So sometimes you win just by being able to defend your price. And then the second possibility, and, and again, this has happened to me many times in my own career, um, sometimes when they complain about your price, they tell you your price is too high, they don't really mean it. They, they just know that if they tell you that your price is too high, you might lower it because most salespeople are weak. Most salespeople are unwilling to stand up and defend their pricing. So a lot of buyers just, they complain about every price. They're waiting for you to lower it. And if you don't, if you explain why, you know, why, why you're not going to lower it, why it is a good deal, even though it may be a little bit higher price, sometimes when you do that, you, they, they say, well, okay, it was worth a try. All right, third possibility. There have been times in my own career when I explained to people why I thought they should buy from me anyway, even at a higher price, and they weren't buying it. They said, yeah, that's all very interesting, but your price is still too high. Well, you know what? It wasn't what I was hoping for. It meant that I was not going to get the order at the price that I really wanted. But it also meant that it was time to go on to plan B. I say that plan A should always be to try and negotiate value. That's what I mean when I'm talking about defending your price. Plan B is to uh, negotiate cost. And what I mean by that is maybe if they don't like your price, you can uh, suggest a slightly less expensive product. And I bet you've all been in the situation where you found out that a price objection really wasn't a price objection, but rather it was a budget objection. And I'm pretty sure if you were telling somebody, you know, I'd like to charge you $100 for this, and they told you, but I only got $80 in the budget, I'm pretty sure you could find a product that you could sell them for $80 and still maintain a really good profit margin. Sometimes all you have to do to get the order is to uh, change an apple to an orange. What you don't do, though, as an automatic reaction is lower your price just because they say your price is too high. All right. That's what I got for today. Kate, do we have questions? Um, I can't see any other questions here, so I think that might be it. Um, if anyone does have any other questions, they can send them through to me and I can forward them to Dave. My email is kate at apper.com.au. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. So thank you, Dave. That was a fantastic presentation. And um, on behalf of Dave and Appa, thanks to everyone who's joined us today and have a great afternoon.